So good afternoon and welcome to today's edition of Lunch with Barry, just another banking crisis. Uh, my name is Alice Eggman. I'm the Alumni Relations Manager at Rotterdam School of Management and I'm pleased to see that so many alumni have uh, tuned in to hear from Barry Standish today. So before we get started, I just need to inform you that this session will be recorded and shared after the event. And if you have any questions during Barry's presentation, please enter them into the chat box and Barry will either address them during or after the presentation. Um, now, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone when I express just how grateful we are that Barry has given his time to host this session for our alumni community today. So a very big thank you to Barry and it's over to you. Good afternoon. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces and familiar names because you've got your cameras on. So if it would be quite nice if you could put your cameras on so that I could see you. If you're, if you're naked, don't put your camera on as usual because we don't want to see that. Um, I, I think the, the, the thanks, thank you for um, Alice for that. Um, I think thanks should also go to Yuri Janssen um, for this session because he actually emailed me about, was it about two weeks ago? Or so to say, please, can I talk to him about what's going on? So I said I would give, I'd give this this talk to the alumni as, as uh, to everybody in time. So Yuri, nice to see you. You're in the top sort of right inside of my of my screen. Um, for those of you who've been in these um, lunch with Barry sessions before, you'll know I always go over time. Okay, so today I'm going to try really hard not to go over time. So with with that as a Backdrop, let me, let me just put you onto the presentation. And I just want to check that you can, if, if you cannot see the PowerPoint, please just somebody wave their hands. So, um, about a month ago, there was a, a very small ripple um, across the financial markets. And if you weren't paying attention, that ripple came and went and, you know, and, and it was effectively gone. Well, let me just try and set something up here. There we go, that's better. Well, I'm trying to set up my screen here. Um, so there was a ripple, like, like a ripple in time, okay, so a ripple in the financial markets, and, and then the ripple was gone. And it appears that it's all over. So, you know, so it was a couple of errant banks that went down uh, one sort of lesser known Swiss bank that went down and, you know, and we can get back, back to our lives as, as we, as we know. What I, what I'm going to do this morning, this afternoon is to take you through some thoughts around the banking crisis. And there's no way that we can know if there is or isn't a banking crisis because there's no data out there. That, that tells you what's going on. So, you know, so we don't have a sense of, of is there really a banking crisis? So, and that's because we're looking on the surface. But if we look below the surface, then without giving away what, what, uh, what we're going to do, um, there's some evidence of some things which are very disturbing. And, and that's really as much as I can say, because I can't say there is a banking crisis. I'm going to let you draw your own conclusions around whether there is or isn't a banking crisis. So this is a this is a play, okay, in um, in six acts. <laughs> so, so so here is Act One, which is a matter of setting the scene, and and the scene and the whole starting point of these banking crises crises was inflation and and interest rates and what's been happening with them. So I want to set the scene by talking about inflation interest rates. And you know, for those of you who, who came to um, the last lunch with Barry's last year, that the, a lot of focus was placed on what was happening with the inflation rate. Um, the conclusions that came out of that lunch with that, that talk um, last year remain the same, that there's inflation out there and that inflation is problematic. Some people think it's coming down. They're wrong. Just to put a no final point in there. So, in terms of in terms of um, inflation, what we've got here is we've got U.S. inflation, as you can see, and it begins to pick up post-COVID. It begins to pick up really in uh, the beginning of last year, and you can see the increase in U.S. inflation up here, up to nine percent inflation. 
Um, and then it begins to tail off here. And the US, the latest data we've got US inflation sitting around about 6%. So there's been a, a very big bounce in the inflation rate, and then it's been it's been tailing off. And as you probably know, and if you don't let me say this to you, this is the first time we've had this kind of inflation since the early 1980s. So it's a very, it changes the world as we know it, and it changes a lot of the monetary policy as we know it. This is Eurozone inflation. Um, Europe, you always do things really well. So the, just before we had inflation, you actually had a period of deflation, which is not very good. I know it sounds good, but it's not very good. But the inflation rate also kicks up. Uh, you kind of beat the Americans up here for once. Um, and the inflation, again, the inflation begins to run. I just want to let me get something else to work with here. And the inflation begins to run down that we're seeing over here. Um, German inflation. The German inflation has not come down. So what we have in Germany is absolute national angst because the Germans are so freaked out about inflation and um, and correctly so because the inflation of the 1920s did all sorts of things to them. Dutch inflation, well, for one very small period in time, the Netherlands was actually a world leader. <laughs> So not just in hockey, but also in inflation rate. So, um, but Dutch inflation also has has come down quite dramatically. But, but I'm just I'm struggling here with my pointer. Let me see if I can do that. No, I can't do it. I can't get it done. Um, the, so, so Dutch inflation has been has been coming down again, sitting at European levels, and then finally um, we get to my favourite third world country, which is the UK. And, and the UK definitely is moving in the third world direction. Uh, how can you have a prime minister for three weeks? Okay, that's third world stuff. Um, and the UK, you can see here that their inflation rate is not coming down. It's pretty, it's pretty constant. There's sort of some small, small, small changes here. So if we, if we look at this then from a, um, It's an apology. I'm struggling here with Zoom. Let me just move this out of my face. Um, if we look at just at inflation, just to get a sense of the inflation, and it, the, the, the story one gets with this um, table is quite extraordinary, really, because what we've got is we've got, apart from the first three, okay, um, and they have their own problems, most of these countries sitting here in the top inflation rate are the rich countries. And sitting below them are okay. France is also poor. Um, the uh, you know these these poorer countries, with the exception of the U.S. And this is so different to what we've ever had before. So so us you know as South Africans, as you know, and where's Australia gone? They're in Australia here as well. Um, we we're very well behaved compared to the Europeans, who are you know not doing a good job of things. Watch the space because we're going to we're going to balance the space against interest rates. So at the moment, we've got the rich world sitting at the top of the inflation rate, the poor world sitting, uh, by and large, okay, at the bottom of the inflation rate. Now, that's, that's the first part of Act 1. Here's the second part of Act 1, which is to now bring interest rates in. And by bringing interest rates in, what we're doing now, just I've just... Um, identified what the axes are. So the left-hand axis is the inflation rate and the right-hand axis is the interest rate because they are, they're in different scales. So you'll note here that we're looking, we saw that 8% earlier on, there's the 8% inflation rate in the, in the US. Um, and here we've got interest rates in the US pushing 5%. So I think there's, there's merit in just looking at what is going on here that you've got around COVID, this very low interest rate over here, and as the inflation rate begins to kick up and kick up and kick up, nothing happens to interest rates. So, so what you've got is you've got the Fed responding too little, too late. So you've already got this huge buildup of inflation, and only then, and it's not just the Fed, you'll see it's, it's ECB, it's Bank of England, it's all the rich banks just effectively responding too late. But the response that you're seeing here is a is an unusual response because it appears that interest rates are going up, and and they are going up. But if you look at the 
the real interest rate, which is the interest rate after you look at the inflation rate, you'll see that inflation is running here. Let's just get the right number. Inflation is running at 6%. And interest rates are 5%. So what it gives us is it gives us a real interest rate of minus 1. So even though, and this is now this is important, because even though the Fed is pushing up interest rates, where we sit currently, the, in, those interest rates are still stimulatory because the real rate, the after inflation rate, is in fact minus one, which means that the banking sector and good corporate clients um, are actually getting paid to borrow. That's what a minus one means. You're being paid to borrow. So although the Fed is trying to, trying to bring down this inflation rate with increasing interest rates, it's still stimulatory. It, it hasn't gone far enough to, to actually do what is required to be done with this kind of inflation rate. So we do the same thing for, for, the, for Europe, the Eurozone. So in the Eurozone case, you've got inflation, if we just get the number round about, let's say, 8%, and you've got interest rates of 3.5%. So what that does is it gives you a real rate of minus 4, minus 4.5%. That's a huge stimulatory interest rate. So you're looking at, at, and to repeat, central banks who are ostensibly trying to slow the economy down and reduce inflation, but, but we're nowhere near what is required to do that. Nowhere near. Now, I know for those of you with housing bonds, particularly if you've got a variable interest rate housing bond, and, and as your bond comes up for renewal, you, you, know, you get that happening. Already, interest rates are hurting but your salary is going up by more than the interest rate. So, so you need to look at it from both sides, that your earning power has gone up, you're paying more on your mortgage, but net overall, um, you're being paid to borrow. And then finally, Britain. So just take note of the, of the, the real interest rates, and I can just go back a bit just to get that number. The US is minus one. Talk to me. Um, Europe is minus four, and Britain is minus six. So now, if we look at just nominal interest rates again, um, and we look at the, the across the world, look who's got the highest interest rates. It's us poor people. I mean, I'm in Cape Town, right? So it's us poor people all the way through here, and then it's you rich people who've got such low interest rates with the highest inflation rate. Okay, so that, that's Act 1. And by the way, if you want to ask questions or want to comment, use the chat box. I've got it open. I can see it there. So, you know, feel free to, to uh, put those questions in. Okay, so now we go to Act 2, which is the banks. This is a very simple one because it sets the seed. And there's only really three banks that are involved in this in the story here. Um, at Silicon Bank or SVB, uh, the Signature Bank, and then Credit Suisse. So this is fairly. Uh, this is a descriptive. SVB is, if you weren't watching, um, as you can see, it's the 16th largest bank in the states. It was very heavily invested in what the Americans call securities, what we would call government bonds. If you're British, you call them gilts um, or treasury bonds and uh, treasury bills and things of that nature. So these are fixed coupon bonds, okay? I'll come back to that. But a lot of the assets for, of SVB and also Signature Bank were in um, um, fixed coupon bonds. Let me just see what Jana's got a question. Can I take Jana's question? I'm, I'm looking at the chat box. Um, uh, Jana, the, the answer to the question is yes, because your salary, if you if you look at um, no, sorry, I can't, I can't answer your question yet. What I was talking about there is that is that the cost of borrowing is less than your salary increase. Okay. Uh, uh, Dirk, people can't see the questions. Uh, sorry, um, Tom, people can't see the questions in the chat box. Can we open that chat box? Yeah, Sylvia, I see your question as well. 
Can we open it? Can can you not open the chat box on your side? Do there are two people in the room? You simply click on the chat box. Okay, now it's open. Okay, so if you can if you can see that, let me just go back because I shouldn't have said push your questions in because then people go apeshit. But anyway, so if I look at Yana's if I look at Yana's uh, comment, um, salaries are rising faster than inflation. You, you're going to see that. Um, but uh, so we haven't gone there yet. Because we're going to have a look at that data. Okay, so that's uh, leave that. The focus the focus on the first question, Yana, was really on interest rates and that you're being paid to borrow. From, um, is it Pasek? Yeah, it is from Pasek. Um, there has been a movement of capital out of um, Europe, basically, into other countries. But in recent times, particularly since um, Ukraine happened, it's more been a flight to safety than, than a, a carry trade issue. So it's, it's, it's a risk premium issue. Um, quite a lot of money went into into um, Switzerland. Ha ha ha! We'll <laughs> to come back to Switzerland in a moment. Okay, and so that's okay. Cool. So if I come back to this one here, this is important. Okay. No, it doesn't give me a pen. Aha! This bit here. Is important, we'll, and, and that's that's the nub of the issue. So we'll come back to that in a moment. I' not at, at all sure what's going on with uh, with PowerPoint here. The second thing that's important about these securities is that securities were, were measured at par value, not market value. So only the very very largest banks in the states in the states are required to do what they call mark to market, which is value their asset, their financial assets at its market value. Whereas most, and still is most of the small banks still market at the par value. Now, if you don't know what that means, just give me a few moments and we'll certainly get there. Uh, but that is what underlies this whole issue and the first, at least the first half of this conversation. Can I see the question? Uh, yeah, uh, Quincy, you, you'll see your answer will come through in just in a few moments. So we'll put that. Okay, but the the trigger for SVB was not actually the securities at all. It was just the falling tech stocks and and uh, SVB being a major lender to tech stock industry uh, that was uh, people were concerned about the lending part of it and were putting money out of SVB. So SVB collapses not because of, of a securities issue, but it collapses because of a tech stock issue. Yeah, but it, I'm not going to take your, that question if you don't mind. Now we come to Signature Bank, and here I, be, I just I love this part of it because we, we things start happening at the speed of light. Well, sort of banking light. Okay, so... It starts on Friday the 10th of March, and people look at SVB and they withdraw $10 billion in deposits. It's the third largest bank failure in US history. Just look at that thing, okay, and just get a feel for, for how big this was. I'm really struggling here. And by Sunday, the bank is taken over by the Fed. And just look at look at the stuff in in um, in inverted commas here. Okay, the Fed says to protect depositors, you know that's okay, and the stability of the U.S. financial system. I mean, read the code in what that's saying. If if the Fed is taking over the signature bank, which is the one of the biggest banks, the third biggest bank, that the Fed must know that there's something underlying what's going on in the American banking system that it has to prop up and, and, and take care of the banking system. That's the first piece of information that we, we have to kind of um, look at sideways to say, is there a banking crisis? R read what's underlined. Is there a banking crisis? Are, are the American banks strong and, and, um, and stable or are they highly problematic? I think the answer is there for you.
Then we come to Credit Suisse, which is obviously a different a, a different beast entirely. Because if you look at the the share price of Credit Suisse, this is a bank that's been in trouble for a long, long time. Okay, so I mean, I've got a fairly short um, share period here, the last two years, but, but this is a long term decline in the price of the share price. Uh, for, I think these are Swiss francs. I think from fourteen to four, which is a huge drop. Um, and by the way, if you want to find the next big bank that can go down, have a look at Deutsche Bank. Look at their share price. Okay. If you have any money in Deutsche Bank, don't run the bank because you're going to make it go bankrupt. So Credit Suisse is, again, it's a speed of light stuff. I, I just, I love this thing. Um, on the 14th of March, okay, Credit Suisse reports Look at the quotation marks. Material weaknesses in its financial reporting. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to read into that. Someone has cooked the books. Okay, it's, it's, I love bankers. They're so polite. But, you know, someone definitely has cooked the books here. So then in, by, by the following day, the, the Saudi National Bank, which is the biggest depositor in, um, in, in Credit Suisse, they back away. On Thursday, the Swiss National Bank pumps in $54 billion. That's an awful amount of money. And by Friday, it doesn't help to do anything at all. And by Sunday, the Swiss National Bank persuades UBS to take over Credit Suisse. Alice, I don't really um, want to take that question because it's, uh, the question Alice is, uh, um, is asking is, uh, could you comment on causes of the, the tech stocks falling? It's kind of off the point. So, so if, I'm, if, if we can come back at this time at the end, we can then um, revisit that question. Okay, so hold the question up and we can talk about it. So then, okay, so that's, that's an easy act. So now we come to the linkages. So what is, what is tying this stuff together now? How do we link Act 1 and Act 2? Well, the starting point is to look at the balance sheet of a bank. So this is your typical, very typical structure of a U.S. bank in terms of the assets that they hold, the liabilities that they hold, and obviously the assets and liabilities must be the same. But in terms of the distribution of the assets, they hold a small amount of cash, they hold a lot of loans, and they hold securities, okay? So, and that's the securities we're talking about that the government bonds or treasury bills or, you know, something of that nature. And of course, their, their biggest um, liability are the deposits. So here is the first linkage. The first thing that we link together here, and that is the linkage between securities and interest rates. And we're dealing with fixed coupon. I'm sure you, many of you have seen this diagram before. Um, we're, feeling, we're dealing with fixed coupon bonds. So a fixed coupon bond means that um, if you own, say, a bond of the Dutch government, they will pay you 10 euros a year because you own the bond, irrespective of interest rates, irrespective of the, um, of the value of, um, of other assets. They pay you 10 euros. That is a fixed coupon. Now, because, because the coupon is fixed, as interest rates change generally in the market, it means that the value of, of other, of non-fixed coupon assets also change. For, for example, let me, let me show you something. If you've done economics at RSM over the last 15 years, you'll recognize the table. Okay, and what the table, but, but just to remind you what, what's going on here. What we've got here is a, is a bond with a fixed coupon. We've got an interest rate, and therefore, the market value of the bond is, is 100 euros. Let me take Gert um, Jan's question um, just for a moment. Uh, Gert Jan, the, okay, so there's two, uh, if you can't see his questions, uh, uh, how and why do banks cook the books? Uh, there's, there's two parts. That one, is, one is that banks can be entirely fraudulent. So Bernie Madoff, for example, um, that, that was fraud. It was pure fraud. In fact, that was a pyramid scheme. 
um, was wonderful pyramid scheme. If you're into that kind of thing. Whereas Credit Suisse, I, I don't want this this um, lectures, this talk is being recorded, so I don't want to put down these things in a recorded lecture. But if they found material irregularities with with um, with their accounting procedures, how can I put this? It can be alleged that somebody was possibly cooking the books. Okay. I think we can do it like that. Whereas, whereas um, um, SVB or Signature Bank, they weren't cooking the books. All they were doing was they were they were marking their um, treasury bills and their bonds to par value rather than market value, and that is that in in the states is entirely acceptable. It's just the very large banks that that um, Bank of America, for example, that have to mark to market. So, if I can come back to this here, so so we're looking at at a fixed coupon. 10% interest rate, and therefore the market value is, is 100. If interest rates were to change, interest rates increase, for the fixed coupon, it means that if you were to put money in, in a savings account, for example, to get a 10 euro out of the savings account, you only need to save 50 euros because of the 20%. Is that again? If, if you were to put money in a savings account to get 10 euros out when interest rates are 10%, you have to save 100 euros. When interest rates increase to 20%, you only have to save 50 euros, which means that nobody, if you wanted to sell this bond that you, that you were holding here, nobody would give you more than 50 euros for that bond. Um, sorry, nobody would give you more than 50 euros for that bond. The only time that that um, this market value does not change very much is when a bond is very close to maturity, so that you you're going to get the money back in due course. But most of these bonds are five years from maturity, ten years from maturity. So you know, in five years' time, it'll all be dead. And and obviously, the converse would happen if interest rates were to decline, then the value of the bond uh, would would increase. But we're not looking at that. What we're looking at is we're looking. Come on, talk to me. No, not. Not allowing me to do anything here. Yeah, we are we are living in a world of rising interest rates, which means that all of those bonds that banks were holding um, have been holding are falling in value. Now that is before I take this uh, talk um, on any further. Th that is one of the policy dilemmas that central banks face because. Since the early 1980s, we've had low, if not declining, interest rates in Europe. They've been zero. They don't move. I mean, in Europe, as you know, it's, it's, it's flatlining interest rates. So the, the risk from holding a bond was negligible. And in fact, when interest rates were, were declining in the 80s and uh, later on in the 1990s, um, it, was, it was a... Um, a no-brainer for banks to hold interest rates because, sorry, to hold bonds because interest rates are declining. So they're just getting more and more and more and more. Um, it's only now, since 2000, uh, 2000, 2022, only since then, only the last year and a bit, that interest rates have been rising. So it's a very small window. And... It's what is amazing is that nobody saw this coming, and it's blindingly obvious that it had to happen. But the bonds that are holding all these securities, they are falling in value. Let me let me show you the, the next diagram. Okay, so here's here's the first linkage. So we're holding these securities, that's our asset, and suddenly interest rates go up. I have to show the animation over. I'm very proud of it. Um, and you'll and and, I'm, and as soon as that happens, the bank is bankrupt because its assets are less than its liabilities. So draw the conclusion about the state of banks in the rich world. Interest rates have gone up. They've been holding security. And the value of their, their securities have gone down, 
and they are bankrupt. There's your banking crisis. Yuri, no, no, it's the reverse. So Yuri, just okay, the question from Yuri, why are loans not increasing in value? Shouldn't increasing interest rates affect the loan value in a positive way? No, it, no, no, it won't. There, there is, if you've got, if you've got um, a variable coupon, then the coupon would also change. Yes, but but the bulk of these treasury bills and and um, government bonds, if you look at the Dutch government bonds, the bulk of them are in fact a fixed coupon bond, because that reduces the risk to government. So so the value doesn't change. It it may be that you've got these these things over here, but if interest rates go up, people will struggle to pay their loans, and in fact that can also decline. So but I'm not I'm focusing just on on the security part of here. Let me just see more the more questions. Um, um, Quincy, yes, sorry, I think I've answered your question just by looking at that one here. These loans, you're going to get defaults on these loans as well. It's not part of what I'm talking about, but you will also get defaults on these loans. Mark, in answer your question, so Mark's question, what forced them to abandon the whole to maturity valuation? Because if you, if there's a run on your bank, you need to be able to sell your securities. So, so let me just get my animation to work. No, okay. You need to be able to, so at the moment, the bank is, the, the bank is solvent. You can hold these things to maturity, okay? And then you get your money back. But if there is demand for cash from the bank and you need you need to become liquid, then those securities have lost value. So now you, you have to sell those securities. Because let's just take the second linkage, okay? Um, Mark, let, let, me, let me hold your question. Just have to the second linkage. Let me see. I've got a, a most strange name here. It's 104535. <laughs> I don't know who you are. Uh, I don't know why you've got that. Um, no. So, so Basil it has been found wanting. The Basil programmers have been found wanting. And, you know, the, if, you, if your memory stretches that far back, after the financial crisis, central banks around the world or in the rich countries required that banks pass what they call stress tests. And they've slowly watered down those requirements, particularly 2018 in the States. There was a lot of, of the stress test requirements which, was, which were wound down. And that has just opened this whole thing up to what we're seeing at the moment. Roel, so Roel's question, how big is the hole in the US and EU? I don't know. Okay, so that is, you know, that, that's how, if you're a bit late and starting the, um, the, the, the talk, I don't know how, how big that hole is because there isn't data. But just look at this thing, okay? Just look at this. Th this is all banks, all banks in the States are hidden like this. The only ones that are not in here are the, are the very large banks who are re re required to, quote, unquote, mark to, uh, mark to, mark to market. So, so they would, as interest rates go up, they've got to then decrease that. But, but you've probably got 80% of the banking sector who are not, who are marking at par. So... So the banks are in trouble, but 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 you would have seen a couple of slides back that the Fed is committed to not having the banks go bankrupt. So the banks are all bankrupt, okay? They all of them. That's hypothetically, but the Fed is not going to let them go bankrupt. But let's just watch that space because we still we we only on Act Three. Can I just see? Okay. Daniel, the answer to your question is yes, that's, that's quite correct. And then um, Minion, does it mean that banks? Yeah, Minion, absolutely. Banks have got, to, have got to bite the bullet. If their bonds go down in value, that is a loss in asset value.
No, Christopher, so, so it's, it's, so Christopher, you've got the wrong uh, direction of thought here. What happens is, let's just come on, go, go back here. What happens is that we're sitting here, everything is lacquer, okay, nothing, no problem at all, okay. And then suddenly interest rates go up and, you, and the value of your securities have come down. You haven't touched your cash yet. The cash is still sitting there. So this is an automatic change that's happening here, but it tips you into bankruptcy. Okay, without spending too long on this one. So now, let's go to the second linkage. Okay. Pure naked fear is the second linkage. Because people realize that banks have gone bankrupt. This is SVB and Signature Bank. And they run on the banks. So that's the second linkage. And now, where are we? Uh, Christopher, now, now your question really comes in here. Now people don't want security, they want the cash. So now if you look at the balance sheet, depositors are now trying to pull their cash out. And at that point, and now you're looking at Signature Bank, you're looking at the three banks that we saw. At that point, the banks have got no cash left and they cannot then pay off the deposits because there's no cash left. So that's where we sit. Okay, so let me pause there for a moment and just see we are about to go on to, on to Act 4. Let me pause there for a moment and see if there's any questions. Not, um, your question, do any countries like the US really have a realistic inventory of assets, gold? Yeah, a lot of central banks sell a lot of gold, um, but it doesn't matter really because, you know, what, what's a really good asset? It's money. Money is a good asset. And, and, and central banks can just print money. So, it's, you know, you don't need it to, to be like that. So it's cool. Let me see what's going on here. Okay, I'm, I'm just pausing for questions if there are. No, Birkin, no, no, they weren't. Okay, so Birkin's question, I, I trust you can see the chat box. Okay, read it. Why did it happen now? Inflation interest rates were there for some time. Um, it, it, inflation, only, only about a year, maybe 14 months. Have we had inflation and high interest rates? So it's quite small in the scheme of things. And because we've not had high interest rates since the late early 1980s, it, it, it's a slow process. All it needed, though, was a trigger. So, so the trigger was SVB. And the, and the trigger for SVB was falling tech stocks. And people concerned about the solvency of SVB. So, so people around on SVB were not looking at any of the stuff. Let's just go back a little bit in this. Can I go back? They were not looking at these securities. SVB were just concerned that they want their money back. So they ran on SVB to, to get the cash out. And that was the trigger. So when people realize, you know, if, you, if I just go back to this picture, this is a classic picture. When people start seeing pe other people queuing at the bank, it sends a signal to them to say, um, th there's something wrong with your bank. There's something wrong with my bank. Um, and I'm not going to take a chance. So this, so what you're seeing here, the leprechaun, he also had money in Signature Bank. Okay. So he pulls his money out of SEP. He pulls his money out of Signature Bank. And at that point, people begin to realize that there's a problem with the banking system. And, and the trigger was, of course, the high interest rate. Um, where are we? Okay, so Elizabeth, if you haven't left already, there, there is a recording. So let me just, uh, okay, that's done. So let me look at the questions, please. So Graham, Graham's question, when you can move money in, in milliseconds, no, no bank can survive. 
and, and very often, even a solvent bank can't survive because they don't have, where's my mind? They don't have enough cash here to handle the, the, the run and deposits here. So, you know, so you, if, if, if the system goes down, you can't survive. And then from Alice, um, Alice, absolutely. You know, what's, um, what is the most sensible thing to do? Um, I'm not sure what ATM is. There's an automatic teller machine. Okay, a bank run will make things worse. But it's your money that you want to get out or somebody else's money. At least, um, at least where's the question? I'd sat at the corner of my eye. No, no, it's not there. At least, the, you know, many deposits in Europe um, and in North America are insured. But people don't like that. They they worry about it. Let me take the question, the rest of the questions. Looking at Daniel's question, the Fed and, and Co are smart enough to see this. Why do they still stimulate lending? Daniel, I'm gonna hold your question. I, I think we'll bring it into the, the last act. So because that's that's the key issue. Daniel's Daniel's question is is the key issue from this talk. Well, Alice, uh, wouldn't banks gotten more robust since the last? So so banks have got more robust, Alice, since the last crisis. But but the the stress tests have been watered down. And the stress tests, I don't believe that they ever really looked at the, the holding of bonds because bonds are, are safe. They're, you know, they're, they're quite safe. Yeah. Uh, uh, one, I'm going to hold your question again. Okay, that will come through in a moment. <laughs> Richard, um, that, that's what this talk is about. <laughs> to what extent should we feel a larger banking crisis? I just don't know. But um, are, are banks in trouble? Yes, they are. Are central banks in trouble? Yes, they are. Wait for the next act. Okay, Scott, I agree with you. Okay, absolutely. All right, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, how will digital current plans affect the market? I'm going to pass on that one. We can take it at the end of the, of the, of the talk. Um, Esther, you, there can't be a run on loans. There can only be a run on cash because um, the loan is the asset to the bank. So the only way the bank can deal with that is actually called in loans. Um, now, depending on the kind of loan you've got, if they start calling in loans, that's when all hell breaks loose. Okay, because that, because that, that's where they actually um, uh, seize your assets and 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 um, auction off your assets. So that's when a financial crisis becomes a real crisis. When when a, when a financial crisis jumps into the real into the real world, uh, that's what happened with the financial crisis. That's what happened with the dot com bubble. No, uh, uh, Prithvi, no, SVB didn't. Well, they did get hit with high interest oh. rates, but that the linkage was with. Um, with the tech stocks. So high interest rates pushed down tech stocks, you know, so it wasn't a direct effect. Find out how is your portfolio allocation? That is private. Because I'm not going to tell you that. Um, so the question from Neon Jing is, what would happen to the borrower from SEO or then or other banks? Well, the, the borrowers are insured. And I think it's up to a quarter of a million dollars is, is the insurance. So not very much. I, I, but I just think that people are concerned, you know, how long is it going to take for the insurance to pay up? So you, you run on your bank. Okay, I've got a million questions here now. Okay. Uh, Zuya, I'm not going to take Japan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's questions done. Um, so Scott, we uh, discussed that. George, there's a rumor that the U.S. Secretary seemed to lift the debt ceiling. Oh, you mean the government debt ceiling? No, that won't. No, that won't help the banks at all. Um, all it's going to do is it's all it's going to do. It's going to make 
the Fed have to fund that um, government deficit. Okay, so let's go on. Okay, so that's the second linkage um, that we've done. So now, now we come to the policy side of things. And this is where we start bringing it together. So the first policy dilemma that central banks face is there are inflationary pressures. Okay, we've seen that. How do you deal with it? You increase interest rates and you go for quantitative, quantitative tightening. Now, if you haven't heard the term before, we've all heard of quantitative easing. Okay, this is the opposite of quantitative easing. Quantitative. So they're trying to reduce the quantum of money which is which is which went out through QE. So that's how that's how you address inflation. That's all you can do to address inflation. But you've got a bank crisis. So how do you deal with a bank crisis? You go for quantitative easing or you reduce interest rates. How would you like to be a central banker? But, but wait, there's more. Because what we also have are zombie banks. Okay, so you know what a zombie is? The living dead? That's a zombie, okay. <laughs> um, so we, we have the living dead here. And zombie banks are banks that, that are, they are being kept afloat by central bank money, but they're bankrupt. And because they're bankrupt, there's economic paralysis because they can't lend out. They keep, they're having to actually pay off all of the bad debt. So they're alive, but, but zombies. And there's some serious lesson to be learned from zombie banks. So in the US, the 1980s, in Europe, um, up until a couple of years ago, and the big one, of course, is, is Japan in the 1990s. I think if you've been through economics at um, RSM in the last while, we spend a lot of time talking about Japan. Um, and and th that was the so-called Japanese lost, lost decade. So zombie banks are a, a real problem. So even, even if you take, one, even if one takes the bank crisis and we, um, we go for QE and we pump money into the system, it doesn't make the banks solvent. And you end up with zombie banks. Okay, so just to summarize this one, what have we got? We've got inflationary pressures that require a particular policy response. We've got a bank crisis that requires exactly the opposite response, exactly the opposite response. And no matter what you do, you're going to end up with zombie banks. So here's the policy responses to SVB. Okay, there's a lot of words, but it, it's not really important. Let's just look for the underlying words. Okay, In, um, on the 19th of March, Okay, just read this. The Fed collaborated with the global central banks to make sure the dollars are available to stem concerns in the global financial system. When, when I read that, the hairs on my neck stood up. And, and I hope yours are as well. They did this because they want to put liquidity into the market. Okay, and th this is quote unquote, liquidity backstop to ease strains in the global funding market. They've increased their dollar swap from weekly to daily. And they're going to keep going through the end of April. And um, that's a little bit late now. They said now at what the last time I read it, it's going to go through until the end of next year. So, you know, so what do you read into this? You have to read that into it. If they're talking about funding the global financial market, then there is a banking crisis. And how are they funding it? Through QE. But we, you know, we're back in the old system. And you can, you can look at the data now, the QE data. So this is the value of US QE starting 2014. So that is the financial crisis and that is COVID and a bit more of COVID over here. And this bit over here, this is quantitative tightening. 
So you can see there is some tightening here. Now, if we focus just on the last little while here, there's your QE. So, so the you know, so the speculation that I've been doing, the way I've been building this thing up, is is to recognize so the the they have no choice. They have no choice but to but to to run QE. Well, they can do one of two things. They can they can, they can go for for quantitative pricing, which is what that we're doing, but the banks will go bankrupt. You can't let that happen. So the only thing you can you can do to just go back to no, it doesn't matter. Um, the only thing you can do is actually go back to where we were and just go for QE again. Let me let me see the questions now. I was not been looking. This is lots of questions. Um, okay, I've read that one. So from Richard, crypto community taking all this is not on the back. <laughs> Richard, are you still into cryptocurrencies? No, no, no. Don't just sell your cryptocurrencies quickly before before they're worth worth, worth nothing at all. Um, Richard, I think the second part of your question we, we don't know. Uh, you know, you, you can go for for compliance, you can go for all that kind of stuff, but we are in trouble. You know, the banking system's in trouble. From Khadat, Khadat, um agree there is a structural problem. So from Alice, um, there are 186 banks across the, the year that may be vulnerable, okay? Um, how come the Fed can promise to back all depositors? Um, very easily, they can print the money. The, the, the Fed can, can back anything because it can just print the money. Simple as that. Of course, there are some downsides to doing that, as you'd imagine. And from Gertjan, yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure about hyperinflation, Gertjan, but definitely this... For me, the, this big inflation bubble that we saw, that the, the flooding um, last beginning of last year, is um, the consequence. Oh, sorry, I lost the plot there a second. Um, is the consequence of what happened in Ukraine? Like I said, it was high oil prices, high energy prices, high food prices, and all the rest of it. But, but I mean, that's that's gone. Um, oil prices are down, commodity prices are down. Yet we've still got that inflation going through. And in my opinion, that that the underlying pressure over all these years is QE. You can't just keep on printing more and more money and not expect there to be inflationary pressures. At Ukraine was the trigger. Okay, let me take some more. I'm looking at the time now, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let me see. So, uh, Devanshu, Devanshu, nice to see you again. Will the US liquidity pressure go down because of? I'm not going to take that question, Devanshu. That's it's it's beyond what we can do. Uh, Helena, like the Mission Impossible, we just need Tom Cruise. He'll fix us. Okay, really, really easily. Um, will QE be able to cover? Well, effectively, yes, because that's what the Fed is doing. Let me show you. I just want to stay on Helene's question and just show you some more data here. Okay, so so we've seen QE in the US. Now look at the Eurozone. So here's your quantitative tightening. It's, it's a short time. Here's your, your tightening. And there hasn't you know, a little bit over here, but but nothing very much. So there isn't QE being funded by the ECB. There's QE in Europe being funded by the Fed. And if you look at the, at the Bank of England, okay, so that's a longer time scale again, but we're interested in this one here. So there's your tightening here, and then a little bit, a little bit of noise. I think it's, it's only noise here. So, Helene, to answer your question, um, who's paying for all of this? It's the Fed. Um, Marsha, to answer your question, can you explain how Q tightening would result in banks going bankrupt? It, it's no, no. Okay, so it's it's not that banks are that it will make banks bankrupt. The banks are already bankrupt, and we need QE to fund the liquidity. If you go for quantitative tightening, it, you you actually reduce the liquidity in the market. Arizona, there was some inflation before the Ukraine war. Okay, 
um, agreed. Okay, so that's cool. So in the interest of finishing this uh, talk on time, let's go to the outlook now. Okay. And the outlook, now we, are, now we start to close the circle. So what's going to happen to inflation? Because that's what started, that's what triggered this whole thing. The, to understand this, we need to understand the notion of a tight labor market. Okay? And a tight labor market is basically where there's low unemployment. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when there's low unemployment, monetary policy is ineffective. Higher interest rates in the face of um, a tight labor market do nothing for inflation. In, in, order, in order that inflation, the, the link between interest rates and inflation is through wages and prices. So in a, in a tight labor market, labor is able to demand higher wages. The only way we can, we can reduce inflation is if you have unemployment. I know it's horrible. If you have unemployment, um, uh, Tom, I'll come back to your question. If you have unemployment, and you threaten people with unemployment, they will take lower wages. And therefore, because wages are down, um, cost of production is down, and therefore prices are down. But if you're in a tight labor market, then people can ask for higher wages, and you have to then push those higher wages, those higher wages through as higher prices. So it doesn't matter what happens to interest rates. If unemployment's low, you can't break inflation. So I, I think I've just said this. So what starts to happen is that because in Europe, at least, you've got these major cost of living increases with low levels of unemployment, what do you do? You ask for higher wages. And you can do it because there are these tight labor markets. And I don't know if you've followed the story in my favorite third world country, the UK, um, who always bleat about everything. And they've been bleating about the cost of living and a living crisis and all sorts of stuff. Um, but they're getting higher wages. They are getting higher wages. Now, it's a new term I want to bring in here. This, these wage increases reinforce what are called inflationary expectations. If you expect inflation, you behave in a way that creates that inflation. And now, there's another new term here, core inflation. And core inflation is inflation excluding food and energy. And it's inflationary expectations that drives core inflation. Let, let, let me explain. I can see I'm running out of time here. Um, if you ask, the cost of living goes up. So what, are you, what have you been doing? If you live in Germany or you live in the Netherlands, what have you been doing? You've been asking for higher wages. The, the, um, your employer has to give you those higher wages because they can't find anybody to replace you. So what does the employer do? The, the employer now has to put up the price of the goods or services they sell, which means when you go to the shops, things cost more. So you ask for higher wages. So you put up prices. So you ask for higher wages. And then you begin to think in the future, what's going to happen to prices in the future? So now you start to ask for higher wages, not based on yesterday's inflation, but based on tomorrow's expected inflation. Once you've got that, you've got inflationary expectations and it becomes self-fulfilling. So let's look at let's look at this. Here's US GDP. Okay, it's a bit sad they had a, a recession here as uh, GDP has been coming down. Now, sorry, in the in the face of GDP coming down, you'd expect unemployment to go up. Look at the unemployment rate. Okay, that's obviously COVID. We won't worry about that. It's around about three percent. And look at how how it's been falling across all of these years here. So in the U.S., we have a very tight labor market. Eurozone, GDP has been falling. Look at the unemployment. Okay, we're looking at about 6.5% unemployment here. But compared to what it was historically, this, of course, this 12%, that's with France and Spain. Okay, what, what, they, what they should do in France is reduce, reduce the, the uh, retirement age to 50. They would cure the unemployment. <laughs> not increase it. Um, uh, UK GDP, 
look at their look at their unemployment so right across this whole spectrum you've got these very very tight labor markets so now let's look at wages so all three all three groups of countries just one moment ago all slowing down look at at what's happening with wages u.s wage growth eight percent which matches the inflation rate euros uh, wage growth is about seven percent no, sorry about five percent uk wage growth about six percent so so we're seeing these economies slow down yet the wage growth continues up which brings me then to the final act which is core inflation we saw when we started this talk that u.s inflation was coming down if you take food and energy out of it, it's not. If we look at the Eurozone, you may remember that uh, the expression we used to use in economics, oh dear, oh dear. This one is very much oh dear, oh dear, right? I mean, it's still, it, you know, it, it appears that that um, Dutch inflation is going down. Look at the core inflation. It's not. It's It's going up. And then finally, UK core is sitting is sitting up here. So that brings us to the end of the talk. Okay, so let's just conclude this one. If we're going to cure inflation, we have to have an economic slowdown. We have to have unemployment. If you don't have unemployment, you can't slow inflation because you can't you can't reduce wages. But the tight labor markets are just working against this. And, the, and core inflation as a result is increasing. So this, the, this the, the, it's these tight labor markets which are highly problematic right in the current state that we're in. If we're going to reduce inf inflation, we need much higher interest rates, much higher. You know, welcome to the third world. 20%. <laughs> Nobody's smiling. 20% is what you need. Not this one, two, three, four percent. That's just that's just silly stuff. Okay. But if you get more high, high interest rates, it's going to cause more bank failures. So you need QE to counteract the failures. So now you have to work with two things. You've got to have really monstrously high interest rate increases on the one hand to contract the economy, but QE to stimulate the banks. So you want to have less money and more money at the same time. You've got to deal with the zombie banks. So you can't allow bank failures and you need QE. And if you have QE, you've got more zombie banks. But just to give it a 30 second summary, <clears throat> the, the, the bank failures that we had were, apart from Credit Suisse, which may have cooked the books, but certainly the American bank failures were just that they were playing by the rules and, and somebody took their eye off the ball. But now we've got a bank crisis. So you have to do something about it. You can't let the banks go bankrupt. So you've got to print the money and give them the money. You've got no choice. But you've also got inflation, which is increasing. So you have to bring the inflation down. You've got no choice. Okay. So I think that that brings me to the, the end of the talk. And I, I hope it was useful to you. Um, I'll, I'll go through some of the questions. On We are four minutes over time. So if you need to get back to your lunch, go into your desk and everything, then feel free. Um, but I'll take some of the questions that are up here. Where do we? Yes, I think Dirk. I'm just trying to go to. Oh, I don't know where the questions even start. Okay, I think from Tom, there's a question. Let's start up there. Um, it's the, what is the metric you use to compare banks? 
I think the share price probably is the best because the market will have the best view of that. So I would I would use the share price, Nicole, to, to do that. From uh, Khadat, what how's the effect on AI and Robux on tight lab markets? Um, Khadat, I think that AI and robotics is is a more long term um, movement than the short term trends we've got at the moment. But AI and robotics will will create more jobs. They will. You know, people are concerned they're going to lose their jobs because of AI. It's never happened in the past. People were concerned that when the motor car came along, there'd be job losses. There weren't. There was job increases. So, um, you know, it's a misplaced fear. So, I agree with you. Okay. Then from uh, Prithi, yes, but wages do not. Uh, nah, Prithi, I disagree with you completely. There's always opportunistic corporate greed. It's good. I like greed. Greed is what makes the world go round. Okay, not theft, not um, 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 unscrupulous, but corporate greed. Good. Because there's other corporates. You see, corporate greed is important because you know if uh, what's in there, Elon Musk becomes very, very rich through Tesla. So what do we do? We make it EVs. It's a good thing to do. So uh, for that, more wages depends on the employer. There can also be ideology. Look at the healthcare. Yeah, so there's a difference here you, you, um, between public sector and private sector. The private sector moves, and the way the public sector gets more money is to go on strike. So feel free to, to go on strike. Okay, so Richard. Okay. So rural, rural. Um, isn't unemployment going to remain low given the demographics, baby boomers? Yes, it is. There's no question that that you're going to have tight lab markets for quite some time. So so that that can happen. Um, it's also that employers are holding onto people for longer. They don't want to do all the retraining and stuff. So so yes, um, there, there are going to, there is going to be tight lab markets. But if you really want to break inflation, let me just get rid of this. Where has it gone to? Um, if you really want to break inflation, you you need to have really big, high interest rates. That's what's going to break it. So even in a tight labor market, if we have 20% interest rate hikes, um, that, will, that will cause a recession and that will break the inflation rate. Karen, the whole system is broken. Uh, yeah. 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 We just have to we just have to deal with it. I like your whether your current whether your position is actually in a car or that's just a screensaver behind you. I, I like the, <laughs> the place that you're in there. Um Ahmed, I don't know enough to answer your question about the Saudis reserve. So I'm not gonna uh, uh, um talk about that. Frank, yes, but but you, what you've got to look at, it's not the inflation rate, hey? it's the core inflation rate. Because food prices and um, energy prices are coming down. So you, you need to look at core, not at the inflation rate. And I think everyone else is just, okay, that's the end of that. So thank you very much for that. Um, I enjoyed it. I hope you did. I hope it is worth your, your time. And I'll see you next time.